To the beat, coming at you with the funny random rambling, talking about all the things that'll make that rain day sunny. Yeah, it's hot and popping, fireball dropping. Come get your laugh on, yeah, it's a concept. You know, he's rocking, robbing the facts and all of the guys. It don't matter where you are or who you with, you gotta tune right in. Bring your girl into your girl to bring your friends, be Robbie Lid. Tune in in your crib, in your way, back to job. He got new shows every Sunday. Here we go. What up, everybody? This your boy B Rob, and I'm back with another edition of the Random Rams with Rob podcast. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you, the listener, for coming back each and every week or however you listen to podcasts. If you're a first-time listener, I'd like to thank you all so much for giving my show a try. And if anybody recommended me to you, go ahead and reach over and give them a crisp high five. Safely. You got to do that safely, though. I mean, we still... You know, people getting vaccines and everything and whatnot, and they think they have a, a license to go um, jump back into the fray and free for all like they used to. But that's not the case. We're still wearing masks, even though Texas was like, now nah, y'all can take them shits off. We gonna open everything up. But you got to think about it this way. Just because they say the state is open doesn't mean privately owned and other businesses are open up like you want it to be. So, you know, Walmart still is enforcing the mask rule loosely and other businesses are still enforcing the mask rule so even though the state is open you can go and come and go as you please but each individual business still has the right to refuse service if you do not come into their establishment wearing a mask with that being said in regards to the crisp high fives uh make sure you sanitize before and after and uh immediately back up six feet (laughs) you know so uh, but if you don't want to go through all those extra precautions, you want to still remain safe. Instead of doing a crisp high five, you can get your social media app of choice and send a well-crafted DM to that person that recommended you to me and tell them thank you. Speaking of social media, you can find the Random Rounds with Rob on various social media platforms to include Twitter at 3R Show, Instagram at the 3R Show, and YouTube. Look for... 3R show and you can find this interview that you're about to listen to in the video form. You can see us. You can see the faces and the grimaces and the disdain for certain topics. Possibly the Undertaker whose name that I don't know. You know, maybe listen to the interview and watch the video and you can see what the frustration is and how I'm talking and whatnot. So yeah. And for anything that I may have forgotten to mention Go to randomrob.com. I got flustered because that name came up and you know which one I'm talking about and uh, got me out of my element for a second. Anyway, joining me on this edition of the Random Rounds with Rob podcast, it is the aerial artist, Zenshi. He is um, a freaking professional wrestler. I don't know. Man, I shouldn't have mentioned The Undertaker (laughs) because I'm flustered right now. Gets me angry, gets my blood pressure up. Um, I hopefully they're doing this uh, Hall of Fame uh, reveals for 2021, and they're inducting also the uh, ones that they didn't get in uh, 2020 last year. So uh, hopefully his name is amongst the few to be retired, and he don't pull that okie doke shit later on and come back for one more match and shit. But in the vein of wrestling. My guest is uh, Zenshi, MLW uh, roster member, uh, freaking a champion in what Chile and Peru. <laughs> this dude is a world traveler, and it was uh, my esteemed honor and privilege to have him on my show to talk with me and chat and everything. Of just get his viewpoints about being a you know having his uh being classified as a luchador, but. Not being your typical luchador as far as um, your psychology and your move set and everything like that. Um, recommendation. If you've never seen him in the ring wrestling, I'm pretty sure he has a recommendation for a match that you would want to see of him. But my recommendation is his match against the Laredo Kid, which we talk about in this interview from uh, MLW. So seek out that match. and You can kind of see what I'm talking about as far as, you know, you look at him, you say luchador. And you just think, 
whole bunch of high fly flippy shit, which he does have in his arsenal. But he's a bit smarter than your average luchador, and he, and for his size, he look he got a lot of power. So I mean, I can only recommend you uh, put eyeballs on this uh, one particular match, but also look at his total body of work. He goes into his uh, love for gymnastics and uh, professional wrestling, how he started um, a, a setback in his career earlier on, but it got him stronger and got him to where he is today. So great conversation, all for your ear holes and your eyeballs if you go to YouTube. And uh, look at the links down in the description so you can find those things and places. One reminder that I want to bring up to your attention, March 29th is a special edition of the Random Rounds with Rob podcast. It is my birthday. And as tradition of the Random Rounds with Rob, the fifth annual Ask Miss B-Rob episode is coming up. So once yearly, Mrs. B-Rob graces me with her presence and she answers your questions. Whatever questions that you have for her to answer, she is here to do that. She does it once a year and it's that time. So get your questions submitted so you can be a part of the show. You can send a voicemail with your questions uh, to 304 825 Six two, and if you have a, a more lengthier philosophical question, you can send those via email to randomrobcast at outlook dot com. So you can email your questions in, and um, if you want to DM me on any uh, social media platform, feel free to do so. If you want to tweet it out at three R Show and use the hashtag Ask Miss B Rob. So there's various ways to submit your questions for the March 29th edition of this show and um, shoot some fun questions out there. It can be random as fuck. Hell, if you want to send your questions in in the physical form via mail you or hell, you want to send me a birthday present. I got a P.O. box that you can go ahead and you can send your your questions and your your praise and everything to. You can send that uh, care of three R show or Address it to B Rob. And the P.O. Box is P.O. Box 9162, Spring, Texas 77387. So, I mean, you can send birthday congratulatory cards. Uh, you can send questions for Ask Miss B Rob. Or if you have a product that you want me to review, um, I can do that for you. Just send it all to the P.O. Box. Uh, Freaking, what did I just say? I forgot it already. Oh, P.O. Box 9162, Spring, Texas, 77387. So let's keep it random in the P.O. Box. Let's, let's keep it fun and extreme, I guess. Extremely random. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and um, shit, let's get into it, man. So I present to you on this edition of the Random Rambles with Rob podcast. Then she. Hello. Hey. I don't know why I was sitting here expecting you not to have the mask on. I don't know what the fuck I was thinking. <laughs> I was like, this is an interview. Why would he do that? He ain't at work. <laughs> but how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Man, How's it I'm, going? I'm, I'm, I finally got this uh, hooked up. Yeah, I've been better and I've been worse, but I'm all right right now. <laughs> but, but I mean, legitly, I mean, how are you, dude? How how am I? This seems like a, such a simple question, but you know, it's always it's always a lot more loaded than that, right? <laughs> <laughs> nah, man, it's as much as you want to divulge, man. It's just like I, I know personally since you are a businessman. One being your business is professional wrestling. These times are doing um, quite a number on y'all, and it's you know it's it's just weird. You know, you it used to be you can just go on wherever and do whatever you want, uh, make your money, make it uh, perfect your trade and whatnot. But that's kind of scarce under the circumstances. But you know, it's I'm so glad you uh, you brought up this this topic because uh, 
this is the third uh, podcast I've done uh, in the past couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, we haven't really touched on, you know, how different <laughs> wrestling is right now. Yeah. And uh, just the, the dynamics, this has never happened before. You know, this is, this is something that's, that's crazy. It's spiraled uh, many businesses, but, you know, just kind of focusing on, on mine, the business of uh, professional wrestling. It's a completely different landscape now. Um, and uh, in many ways, you know, I was very fortunate to, you know, to be among, you know, the top companies in the U.S. And to have at least a spot at the table um, when everything kind of uh, started shaking back up again. With that being said, you know, I feel like uh, us at MLW are, are really kind of fighting for survival just like everybody else, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, we haven't had many events lately, you know? Uh, it's a little longer in between chances to get in the ring and, 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 but, but at least we get to keep doing, you know, what we love. At least we still got a spot at the table, but Hey, it's a dog eat dog world out there. And, you know, I'm doing what I can to prepare myself for the next opportunity always. Yeah. And, and that's kind of like what I wanted to hit on and everything. Cause usually most of your time, I mean, 13 year veteran, right? Uh, oh, it's, uh, oh, 11, 11, 11 ish. All right. So 11 years has just been time putting in, going up and down the road, perfecting your craft, trying to add new things to your persona, your, your character, everything. And now it's just skirt. So that in between time that you were speaking of to where, you know, you're not sure when the next show is and or hell. I mean, when can you get into a gym or whatever, you know, under these circumstances? Where do you live, Rob? You to kind of focus your mind and, you know, just keep busy. Essentially. Yeah, yeah. What what part of the country are, are, do you, are you living? I am in Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas. And what's the situation out there right now? Is it? I know. I'm in I'm in near Atlanta right now, and we haven't been the most uh, responsible when it comes to this whole <laughs> no. thing statewide. I've seen a lot of uh, concerts we've been the going on. Of everyone, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> but I'm just wondering what, what's it like in Texas right now. Well, here, some places are open but they do it at a limited capacity. So like, if you say you want to go to Red Robin or some kind of burger place mm -hmm. or something like that, you can go in and it's like, you can sit at a table, but like the next three tables over are blocked off. You can't sit yeah, there. Yeah. You know, they being cautious with how they place people in establishments. Some of them is just, you order the food, you come pick it up, you get the hell out, you know, or in, Walmart's still open, you know, you know. Yeah. Got okay. So similar situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just ask because, you know, I, you know, I, I, I go down there for, uh, you know, the rest of MLW and Florida's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Do, do this. <laughs> and then I go to a plane, literally, you know, I come from Boston and everyone's walking around. It seems like in bubble suits. It's like, they got literal walking <laughs> through a campus and they got bubbles, people sitting in tables or whatever. I'm like, wow, just the stark difference in the same country. Right. But to get back to the to, to your question, all the time in between, you know, that was more so in 2020, more so when everything kind of hit the fan was in March. I had just come back from an uh, international trip, just come back from Peru mm -hmm. and uh, did two great shows out there. Literally the last two matches, two shows in Peru, I was part of the main event <laughs> of the last one. So it was a cool, you know, ending and, and all that kind of stuff. I literally got back in the country four days before they closed the border four days before the and i almost missed my flight back you know just i got there too late but i was able to you know get the flight and get home and then i get back and i'm like what's this going on like what's what's happening and then that friday boom people were stuck there so that was a huge shock you know um and then followed by you know mlw canceling their events and each yeah. month I'm like, okay we're gonna have it next month okay but no one knew anything so it was just kind of just waiting and waiting and waiting. And I'm the type of person that needs something to train for, mm -hmm. you know, like as a growing up as an athlete, as a, as a gymnast, um, you know, we practice hours and hours and hours in the gym. And then we go to compete a few times a year to really show who mastered their craft and without anything to train for it, it, it you know, it's, I did get out of shape. I did get, I did lose my touch, you know, and I, I felt like I had, uh, I had to keep finding some way to, to, to counteract that. Finally, you know, we come back in October and that was really the first time we started like 
wrestling again and it was still sketchy you know we did testing mm -hmm. on the last day um which is kind of weird um you know it went well no one you know, okay so we start tiptoeing back in i'm fortunate to be right around uh the wwa4 wrestling school ar fox mm -hmm. running thing best trainer in the in the country and we're buddies um so i can go up there whenever and you know he, everything was closed there too for a little bit but you know we started tiptoeing with small groups and and stuff but even then you're playing with fire yeah. but you know what are you going to do you're going to live in a bubble forever so you know we, we just try to be real smart about it and, and you know just keep it real small i go i go much later when it's like very few people there and you know and um you know it's a different pace it's a different pace but we adjust mm. and that was kind of weird for me or whatever you talk about mlw and whatnot lifelong wrestling fan but only over the past few years have i been branching out into other pr promotions of wrestling like mlw nice freaking, uh, you know aew just kind of sprung up so i don't really count that one but i'm um, getting really into new japan and just whatever i can find on independence which is kind of how i come across you and what really drew me to you was even when I watched your match against you and the uh, with uh, the Loretto kid, uh huh, the thing that I first noticed you on way back when I first reached out to you or whatever, because I only knew you off of this one thing, <laughs> you know, that I saw, and it was just the tag match. Are you talking about the tag match? No, no, the um, the one for the uh, freaking Triple uh, A Cruiserweight title. Okay, okay, yeah. So. I seen that way back when I when I first originally we reached out to you because that was like bam I ain't never seen no shit like that and then I go back and I watch the match that you just recently had with the Laredo kid I see it again because MLW went dark like how you said for a while so I kind of missed the boat on that I fell out of, of it with it but I would track you on Instagram okay the goddamn I don't know what even the <laughs> announcer said it, the commentator I don't know what to call the shit the Leaning Tower of Zen that's there the name it is. God. <laughs> one, you answered one of my questions already when you was uh, just going through uh, your situation and how you get got start to creep back into training. You know, you speak about being a gymnast. So what was the passion first, being a gymnast or a professional wrestler? It was, uh, you know, well, I'll let you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. It's a little bit of both. I mean, right, because it's just like. They're both always blended in my life. They've yeah. always kind of blended. You know, when I was maybe five, six years old, I used to watch wrestling with my brother, my older brother. We used to, right in the height of the, the Monday Night Wars. So you had Sting was at his all time, you know, Hulk Hogan, Booker T, those are big names. And, uh, and you know, I would watch it with him, you know, and, and things like that. Eventually he moved out of it. He moved on, got a job, and I fell out of wrestling, out of, out of that vision. And then it was, you know, gymnastics. And then right around gymnastics was finishing. I, I felt a little, you know, burnt out of that. That's when I kind of really fell in love with wrestling. It's always been an intertwining in my whole life, I could say. I, I, and I feel that because, uh, you know, I come from a military family. So coming up, I always felt like, you know, I want to join the military and everything. But I loved wrestling and martial arts. Oh, love martial arts. And... I did a little bit as a child as far as martial arts go, but I never really got into the wrestling because wrestling was in and out of my life. Kind of like how you were saying, it's like, I found it as a kid, but I only found it because I knew Hulk Hogan, the actor, not the wrestler. Mm -hmm. So then I found out he was a wrestler and not an actor. Then I found the wrestling. And then, you know, I was a little kid. So I was like, fuck, I want to go outside and play. Forget wrestling for right now. Then years later, I would come back to it. And we get into the Monday Night Wars and all this other stuff. And, you know, that's what really hooked me. Stone Cold and all those other guys come later. And mm -hmm. I was like, wrestling is the bomb. I want to do this. Then I get a girl pregnant and I need a job. So <laughs> real life laughs in the face sometimes. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Screw all that uh, martial arts stuff I was talking about in this wrestling you know, I'm going to join the military. So I joined the military, but through my time in the military, I got to learn some form of martial arts because they have their own martial arts program. And, you know, another thing that I wanted to be as a kid was a stunt man. Ooh. Allowed me that, that opportunity to be somewhat of a stunt man doing rappel tower <laughs> and all kind of other crazy shit. Awesome. And because of the military, 
I got stationed in the armpit of Missouri, Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. But because of being stationed there, I was exposed to the most independent wrestling and wrestling I ever been in, you know, mm -hmm. in my life. Because Harley Racist School was not too far from there. There was a local promotion there. WWE would always either land in Springfield or St. Louis, which I was dead center in the middle of them. So I can go hour this way, hour this way. And they would always run up and down that area. So I would see independent shows. I would go to WWE shows. I had the itch to goddamn go to the Harley Ray School, but that was two hours away. And I wasn't going to do that on a weeknight and had to go get up and instruct students at the schoolhouse the next morning. <laughs> but I found an independent show. I stayed after. I was like, do y'all need any help with anything? Here I am, 30-something years old already. I was like, I don't care what it is. I mean, do you need help with your Facebook? Do you need somebody to help you move the ring around? I'm your guy. Dude told me to come out to an event they was doing. I helped him set up the ring, and they trained me for a bit. So I got to actually train, be inside a ring, take the bumps, get my ass whipped. Didn't culminate in the match because it kind of coincided with, you know, the time that I was separating from the military as a whole and my, mm -hmm. kind of my training and whatnot. So it was just like, it did, really didn't matter. I was kind of upset about it, but I got to do it. You know, it was part of that whole thing. I wanted to be a martial artist. I wanted to be a wrestler. I wanted to be a stunt man and be in the military. And I kind of got to, to do it all in one, you know, it was fucking great. Yeah. What a story. Huh? What a story. No, it was just, I. I can't see it because I got my coat on, but goosebumps every time I tell it because it's just like I remember just seeing the ring just like not put together, just out there laid out on the ground. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. fuck, that's the ring. <laughs> like, you know, you know, I just like, here I am. I'm, I'm already an older guy, whatever. I know how it works and everything. I, I just know how wrestling is. It's not, you know, well, <laughs> somewhat, you know, you know, I know it's uh, scripted to an extent. And I'm just like, I was putting the ring together. They were showing me how to do it. And I never stepped one foot in between the ropes because I felt like I didn't pay dues. I wasn't worthy enough to do that. I just like, I had that much respect for it. And I was just like, <laughs> I'm sitting there holding the corner pose while they putting the, um, the side beams on it. I'm just like, I'm holding the goddamn ring. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'll tell you the first, the first time I was in a ring. So, uh, so, you know, when I kind of, you know, really fell in love with wrestling, I was in a pizza parlor, just waiting for a pizza. I was about 14 years old. Um, I was in my last, you know, year of gymnastics where, you know, my, my body wasn't kind of holding up. It was a lot of practice, a lot of, I wasn't sure if that's what I really wanted to, to do. But as an athlete, you know, I, I loved all the things that made me, you know, but you know, I'm waiting for my pizza and they have Friday night Smackdown on the TV. And, um, and I see Eminem come out and of course I'm like, Ooh, Melina, like, Oh, wow. Like, should I be, <laughs> am I allowed to watch this? Yeah. And you know, <laughs> Eminem just being super hypersexual with the belts. Of course, I'm just glued to the TV. Um, and then da -da -da -da, Batista comes out and this giant muscle guy and I'm like, all right. And then this little guy with a mask comes popping out of the floor. Who's that jump? And I was like, who's this guy? And he's, Shit sitting there doing backflips on everybody's heads and spinning people around with his legs. And I'm like, holy crap, this guy is the bomb. I, I can do I can do that. Like, you know, I, I, I bet I could do that. Like as a gymnast, like, yeah, he's flying around. That's my people. So I became a closet wrestling fan. I didn't know any other wrestling fans. So, you know, I went to this little church group and they weren't wrestling fans. <laughs> I'm going to talk to people at school weren't wrestling fans. So I would just watch it. When I could on UPN, catching the Friday Night Smackdown, wondering what's on Raw because we didn't have cable for years, um, <laughs> checking it out. And uh, eventually I was like, all right, I was 16 or so. I had been, uh, I got Triple H's book, Making the Game, and he kind of inspired me to start lifting weights and exploring that, that realm. And I was like, all right, I got to try this thing. So I go online. I'm like, all right, wrestling school. Where do I start? WWA4. That's weird. WWA four uh, wrestling school right here in Atlanta. Oh my God. 25 minutes from the house. I take my shitty car up there. And uh, <laughs> actually uh, before I even had a shitty car, 17, my mom took me up there just to check out a show. Every Thursday they have a free show and it's for the students to practice in front of a live crowd. 
that is such an underrated like aspect of a good wrestling yeah. school. You could get so much experience that you can't get, uh, you know, it's a free show and we go to the free show and good old total protection. Mr. Hughes is, uh, is, uh, is there and he's the big shot. He stole the undertaker's urn. He's the big shot guy there. And you walk in and there's this old man, Frank, right by the door. And, you know, old man, Frank was the owner and he was about 85,000 years old. And he loved dog. <laughs> he always talk about, Hey, how old are you? But my mom had a service dog too. So they were drawn together as far as conversation. So my mom's over there talking with Frank. I'm looking at how big this Mr. Hughes guy is. And then, Oh, the show's about to start. Okay. So we sit down and there's like, I don't know, 15 other people there, maybe a little less, maybe 12 that night. And the first match of the night was Jim. It was Ash and Jimmy, two guys from the UK versus the hooligans. You know who the hooligans are? Sound familiar. In the Midwest. They're, they're, they wrestle a lot out there, Chicago, Missouri. Anyway, but they started at the WA4 as well. And it was funny. I, I I found out later in my career, I'm like, oh, wait, you guys are the same. You guys are the first like live match I've ever watched. And now we're like alumni together. It's kind of, it's kind of funny <laughs> anyway, but the match was not great because they were still learning and the whole show was just very, you know, it was three matches. And, um, and I was watching and I was like, I appreciate the effort of the guys, but I was sitting there the whole time going, I could do it better than them. I could do it better than this. Like, you know, why is why wouldn't the guy like I was into it. So from that point on, I had to try it. And um, and that's all she wrote. I got stories for days, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy. It's just, I even do that now after the fact that I had a little bit of training or whatever. I don't claim to know everything, but it's just like, it makes you look at it different now. Cause I can just, I can't even remember how I used to enjoy wrestling before I actually had that training. Cause now I'm just like, Ooh, that was kind of sloppy. I was like, Ooh, is he really hurt? Or, you know, it's just, I'm just looking at it with a, a skewed vision almost. And well, training know, is different though. Training is different from a real match, mm-hmm. you know, in training of, of course, we're going to be a little more cooperative with each other because, you know, it's just like, if you were, if we were an MMA gym, for example, and we're sparring and we, we put together drills where today, you know, we're adversaries, but in real life, you know, so you got to get a little taste. You got to get a little taste of how to train for a, a match, but it's different when you're actually out there in front of the bright lights. It's oh, it's yeah. completely different. You know, you could do a hundred training matches and you know, it's a different experience mm-hmm. getting out there. So, um, um, yeah, you, you got a little taste, but Hey, there's, there's, there's more to it than that. You can't spill all the secrets. You don't know them yet. Yeah, you don't yeah, know all of them cause, yet. Cause that's hell of shit. I know. I don't know. Cause like, <laughs> um, I was matter of fact, I was just watching, um, new Japan. Uh, earlier the day, I was watching freaking um, Hiromu and Show, for and, and I was just like, "How, you know?" Because I mean, <laughs> how, you know? And, and it's just like those guys you, you have those uh, occasional matches to where you hear you might hear one guy call a spot or something like that. But you look at these two guys specifically in this match, I was like, "They ain't calling shit. They just beating the shit out of each other." <laughs> That's wrestling done right. Mm -hmm. That's what it's supposed to be. And Mm -hmm. to be honest with you, (laughs) wrestling has become so full of shit in a lot of ways. I'm just going to go ahead and put it out there. So full of shit in a lot of ways. It's like, guys and gals, (laughs) Mm -hmm. head kicks. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to him. I can't do it, man. I can't do it. I can't. I, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it because this is what I'm talking about. Well, well I mean, I I'm mean, just there's... gonna say it looks very suspect that I just watched Conor McGregor get knocked out from a what was it, a straight right hand from Dustin Poirier, but Yo Ash just took a spinning side kick an enziguri, a top rope super kick, a destroyer, and a spinning 540 kick, and you're still on your feet. In fact, now you're somehow on the top rope going for your finisher. Yeah. So what that tells me watching, maybe the other guy's 
really shitty at kicks because those were, you know, he didn't, he didn't really <laughs> kick you very hard. Or you have the hardest head in the human history. And either conclusion, I don't know. I'm not, I wasn't there. I'm just watching from I mean, a there, fan's there point some, of view. And I'm just saying it looks goofy. A tongue in though. Just saying it looks goofy. And I don't know what that is. That's not pro wrestling. You know what I'm saying? This, but, this hey, is they, an art form and there's a way to do it. Yeah, but there might there's be a way to do it. And I'm, you, know, you know, they got hard heads. <laughs> they got hard heads. Oh my God. They're hard headed. That You know what? That's why it doesn't hurt them because they're hard headed. <laughs> I see what That's you the did there. <laughs> Literally, they're hard headed and they're hard headed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I've noticed the change from, you know, when I watched wrestling as a young child all the way up until now. It's just a lot of oversaturation of moves and a lot of the moves that I, we would see as kids, like Jake Snake famously, DET. That was the end of the match. You ask him, hey, Jake, what did DT stand for? What did DT stand for? The end. <laughs> you know, that's what he said. It's over after this or whatever. Now we got tornado DDT. We got freaking somersault DDT. We got, uh, and they'll pop right up. All Yo, right. Speaking, on the, speaking on the DDT, I just watched the match. Well, I just watched the clip of the match. I saw the most beautiful, I'm not going to say who it is because I love both competitors dearly, but I saw the most beautiful second row DDT with leverage executed beautifully looked nasty. And the person taking the DDT was the one initiating a move 30 seconds later, not 30 seconds later. I'm like, what is happening? And these are people you would expect like, Oh my goodness. So it's just like, it takes you out of it a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, the I'm as guilty as the next quick. guy for most of my career. I'm going to say it. You watch some early Shinron matches. There's plenty to shit on, <laughs> on my career. There's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it, but what I'm learning more in my recent years is really until you've really been doing it, really study this and really like, you know, that you become to realize there's, there's, there's a way to do it. So there's a balance. I'm all about pushing the envelope and, and trying to find new ways to, you know, to fight. I don't feel like any one style is, you know, should be put in a box. However, things have to make sense. Yeah. And Bottom now, line, things have to make I understand sense. that because a lot of what you're talking about is kind of what I see in a lot of um, younger wrestlers or whatever, the ones that hadn't been wrestling too, too long. Um, and some, I mean, they, I mean, it's to use a, a, a term that I've heard thrown around the internet, spot monkeys, you know? But, Ooh, those spotted monkeys, those little spotted monkeys everywhere. I hate when those spotted monkeys get in the ring. I don't know what spot monkey means. Well, spotted but, monkey, um, yeah, get them out of here. <laughs> but um, with, with you, I did um, go back and I watched some of your older matches and everything. And compared to what I've seen most recently, like the one with the uh, Laredo Kid, is I'm really uh, proud of that, that contest, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Because from what I saw in that match, it's like it wasn't so much high fly from you. I also saw some strength in there. It's like I seen you toss the guy around. And I was like, I was pretty impressed by that. I was like, oh shit. I was like, look at this guy. <laughs> look at this guy trying to be a muscle guy here. Yeah, the the, the, the Dougie boy. I know what move you're talking about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then um what what else? Um a lot of the, you was actually throwing your body at the guy, you know, for for so, most of the match too and it was just like you show you were showing like you were trying to hurt this dude like you I'm trying to I'm, win the match. I'm trying to win the match. Yeah, exactly. Trying to win the damn match, kid. You know what I mean? Stop trying to you know, do your flips and try to win the damn match is, 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 is the point the point of it. Mm-hmm. If your flips are going to help you win the damn match, okay, if that's your technique, but you better have practiced it. You better be on point. You better be not tripping over yourself. If you're going to do your... This is what Low-Key told me one day. Oh, this is when it clicked. Yeah. It was after Dominic Garini. I fought Dominic Garini, and I was so hell-bent on making this beautiful styles clash between Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Lucha Libre, and I was excited for that, but I was focusing on it in the wrong way. I was thinking of how can I make the coolest counters from his things? And that led me to me getting injured off the top rope and him, you know, it was some controversy, but that's how it ended. It didn't, it didn't go well for me. Low key yeah. told me at the end of the back, he was like, Hey, I, I, low key has been someone who's seen me from those early days. We've always shared locker rooms together, pro wrestling syndicate beyond rest. There's, there's been times, but he said, Hey, your technique is your technique but you got to make sure you come with it. You know, if you're going to make sure you, you hit the guy, you got to hit the guy. Like he really like looked me in the eyes. and was like, 
you know, whatever you bring to the table, you got to make sure it's refined and mastered. And that's really what I've been honing in on and focusing, especially over the past few years. And I, I'm glad you noticed the difference. Yeah. And <laughs> you speaking to Loki or whatever, I forget what match that was, but um, I remember him fighting this one guy and he, you know, how he usually backflip out of the, the German or whatever. I think dude held it too long and dropped him on his head. And oh, Loki I got up that. and kicked the shit out of this dude in the face. Dude, did, he, he even said it in the interview later or whatever. He's like, you know, I just laid there and took it because I knew I was wrong. <laughs> That's called a receipt. Yeah, oh, man. Boy. Loki was another one, man. I, I I wonder where his career would have been if he would have stayed in WWE. But I kind of understand why he left because it's similar to um, one of my favorite uh, wrestlers, uh, MVP, who is currently back. He left because he had other aspirations and goals in professional wrestling. He wanted to uh -huh. go to New Japan, and he did do that. And matter of fact, he became the first inaugural, uh, you know, Intercontinental IWGP champion or whatever. So. That was cool that he can go and do that. And I kind of feel Loki, you know, similar. But hey, don't cry for Loki though. You know, Loki is a former world MLW World uh, Heavyweight Champion. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think you know and he stabbed Loki somebody. I seen it. <laughs> if, if he would have stayed in WWE, uh, what I know is he'd be a whole lot less uh, happier than he is now. Yeah, and that's, so that's Loki what is the locker room leader of Major League Wrestling, mm -hmm. no matter who's the champ. Um, you know, when Loki speaks, everybody listens is what I'm saying. He commands respect when it comes down to his peers. And I feel like no matter what appears on TV, even, you know, how you rank up and, you know, uh, amongst your peers, as far as respect is really all you got when it comes down to it. If you don't got respect. People don't respect you. If you don't respect others, people are not going to want to work with you, you know, and, uh, and then that's it. You're, you're done. You know, yeah. you need each other for this kind of business. And Loki is someone that you know, always has, uh, you know, I've been intimidated by when I was younger, you know, I would find myself in shows with like, oh gosh, the Iron Sheik is over there and uh, Booker T and, you know, Harlem Heat is here, blah, 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 but Loki's on the car and he's always kind of like, you know, looking around and I'm always like, he just had this demeanor. But as I grow to know him a little bit more, he's just one intense guy. <laughs> he's just intense with everything he does. Yeah, you talking and about MLW you is a great environment for him. Uh, to really uh, showcase that intensity. Yeah, you talk about how he demands, uh, you know, the attention and the respect in the locker room or whatever. I said, like, man, it's kind of hard not to demand anything with a voice like that. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, sir? <laughs> <laughs> He's the man. <laughs> oh, man. But, I mean, what initially got you hooked? Ray Mysterio and everything. You it was, it was, was Mysterio. I was a Mysterio mark and it was WWE was all I knew. You know, I didn't know anything about independent wrestling, but you know, it's the, the first live match I've seen was, you know, Ash and Jimmy and the hooligans and mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, okay. So uh, it was, uh, it was that, uh, you know, 16, I started, you know, trying to save the money. 17 got a job at Arby's trying to save the money, did the three day camp, loved it. Um, it was hard, you know, uh, and, and wanted to come back. I remember my first day, um, um, AR Fox was uh, three, three years my senior, like three and a half years. So he was already there. Who else was there? Jonathan Gresham was there, rare, there at the time. Uh, I like Apollo that, dude. Cruz, I just found out about him. Apollo Cruz had just started about three months before I came in. Um, and uh, he was like, hey, who's your favorite wrestler? This is Fox. And I'm like, uh, Rey Mysterio. He's like, who, who else? I said, Matt Hardy. He says, who else? <laughs> and I said, like, Gail Kim. Or I like, I said, only like, I didn't even say Gail Kim. I didn't know about TNA at the time. I love Gail Kim. Um, yeah, but I'm saying all these WWE guys. Yeah. And uh, he's just like, ugh. And he just like turns and walks away. And I'm like, that's my first meeting of AR Fox. Um, and then later he would put me through the paces or whatever. You know, they like to take the people that only know about WWE and show them, though, this is reality. Like, you know, you've been sitting here watching at home. You know, this is uh, this is this is what it is. And most of the people that walk through that door don't come back. You know what I mean? We weed them out. And I was able to uh, to outlast a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people come and go. But hey, 11 years later, it's crazy. I'm still here. Yeah, I just like I, I just think that's crazy because, you know, I, I, I say it now because I'm kind of breaking away from it, it was like we were brainwashed or whatever to think that this was the only wrestling in town, you know? Yes. Cause I didn't, I didn't go to my first independent show 
until like 2014. Mm. You know? And that was just by, I was walking at the grocery store or whatever, and there's like live professional wrestling. I was like, oh shit, what's this? And then I went and then that's why I met the people. And I was like, hey, let me help you with the ring and shit. And that's what kind of did it for me. Then um, Jeff Jarrett brokered the deal with New Japan and started putting that on USA TV and shit. And I was like, yep. oh, just get Nakamura. Yeah. Yep. And it's just been a tailspin from there, just finding new shit and finding. And then you realize like all, all this time, all this time I've been missing all this good stuff. There's so much to watch, right? Exactly. I keep harping on New Japan because that's kind of like the starting point for me as far as something different. And most recently, I just, because I love how they, if you're familiar with New Japan World, they categorize everything. And I like mm -hmm. that shit. So I went <laughs> to the IWGP Intercontinental Championship and I went back all the way to the first match when MVP initially won it in 2011. And I watched every title change all the way up until current. Wow. It was categorized and it was all laid out. And I was like, yeah, wow. I just watched everything. And I was like, this is fucking great. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I need to do that. I need to, that sounds fun actually. Yeah, sounds good. I, mean, I don't watch as much wrestling nowadays. I I, I need to uh I need to keep uh keep a pulse on it. <laughs> well, I mean, and it's also, I mean, since it's your livelihood for the most part, I mean, it's kind of good to take a break every now and then. Yeah, I can't watch my I I I I I find that I get way less creative when I watch a lot of wrestling. Now there was a time where I, you know, watched a lot of wrestling wrestling and it's good to just learn the language basically mm -hmm. it's its own language yeah and if you're training in it like you need to study but at this point when i'm when i i have the training and now it's like what do i want to bring to the table that's unique that only i can do at this point you know when i watch too much of my peers i just start my i start thinking like them and then when you start thinking like them you start performing like them and then mm -hmm. you're all in a box again so I find that, you know, I, I jump back in when I hear something good or, or yeah. you know, I might uh, a, a card or a match I'm interested in or I want to support maybe a friend or something. Um, and then I retreat back into my own world and that's when the magic happens. And then I come back and try it out on a, a victim. <laughs> All right. So a couple of things I want to touch on, because when I get to speak with a couple of professional wrestlers, or whatever, I like to ask this question. You know, I want to see if you, because I can kind of see through the mask, whatever. I mean, you look like you want to me. So uh, <laughs> this is a question I'm I want to Atlanta, ask you. Down <laughs> south. <laughs> yeah. So this is a question I want to ask you and see if you notice the trend. Why do, I mean, I, there's other people that do it too, but why do just about every black professional wrestler, male and female, do some variation of the flatliner. <laughs> See, I mean, I, you're thinking about it now. You your is turning. I know you know what I'm talking you are about. Not lying. The flatliner or the STO is next. Yeah, reverse. But, oh yeah, STO. It's usually the flatliner. I don't reverse know. STO, one of those flatliner, uh, pay dirt, whatever the hell you want to call it. I mean, all of us do it. Except for me. Except for me, I don't do a flat. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Video. I haven't seen it because I would have called you on it. <laughs> yeah, because I don't. I don't follow trends. Um, <laughs> you know, I I am my own trendsetter. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's very interesting. That's very I, interesting. I, have, I don't I even have think dubbed, they realize. It. Yeah, I have dubbed that our move. You know, I know what from what I understand of the move. I know it came from Ghetto and them in New Japan, and then uh, Canyon brought it over in WCW when he was Mortis and shit. So mm. that's. That's what I first saw it originally was uh, with a uh, canyon. That's but the history. I always thought I always thought the black people move was the cutter, because that's why I stopped doing cutters. I did the most. I did the most beautiful hands uh, to Jerry hand spring jump yeah, back yeah. cutter. It was the easiest move too, because I I could do the handspring all day and just jumping back. I had so much time to look at my opponent, target him, grab him, boom. But I realized as beautiful and and as the crowd pleasing as that was. Everybody started doing the freaking cutter. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, in the super kick, that's another one. Yeah. I don't do any super kicks anymore. Never. Like, you know, so there's certain things I refuse. Yeah. Well, I mean, a, that that was the thing about it, too, because that was going to bring it around to where, like, uh, uh, oh, saturation removes, like I was saying, um, Jake the Snake and the DDT and all that. But the, definitely, I mean, you, you need, you'll see it more than me, but that's the black people move, the flatliner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> super kicks. It goes back to what you said before, you know, motherfucker got knocked out in UFC with head kicks or whatever. And you take 12 of them and 
pop right back up and do your own super kick. And then, um, yeah, you can only break the rules when you have the ability to break the rules, like the Young Bucks. Super big respect to them. I actually wrestled them in the ring. Stand up guys, you know, awesome. When you have the ability to break the rules, then you can break the rules like yeah, the Young they, Bucks did. But yeah. the problem is just like Eminem broke the rules, right? Everybody now wants to be Eminem. Everyone now wants to be the, the people that broke the rules. You can't, there can only be one. So yeah. after Shawn Michaels and after the Young Bucks broke the rules of being boom, 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 that's that's it. Everybody else is trying to copycat, copycat, copycat. And it's to, to be honest, you're only making the Young Bucks look cooler and yeah. yourselves look goofier, yeah. to be honest, when you do it wrong. Because I mean, there's a now, place for the super kick. There's a place for the flatliner. There's a place for DDTs and RKOs and flipping destroyers and all that kind of stuff. There's a place for it, but a lot of people don't know the place. Mm -hmm. That's what's frustrating. And then we get into a point to where, like, all right, our generation of wrestling fans are just kind of fading out, and all the people are, that are coming up behind us are all they're gonna know is like Young Bucks and all these other guys doing these same moves over and over, and they're gonna think that's commonplace. You know, that kind of scares me a little bit because, you know, we talk about everybody doing the cutter, but I don't think that became so much popular until Randy Orton started talking shit about people. It was Randy Orton that definitely brought it in. Yeah. And those memes where they was doing with yes. Randy Orton doing all the diamond cutters. I mean, yeah, yes. I call the diamond cutters on everybody and shit. So yes. I mean, then I just seen everybody do it. it freaking. That's precisely crazy. when I stopped. Yeah. And then, That's precisely when I stopped. Yep, it was all the, the, the I love the meme. The meme is awesome, but yeah, I had to I had to separate myself from the crowd. <laughs> so yeah, it's just it's just crazy. Because <laughs> I even made like a, I think I made a four minute video about that flatliner thing too. I had to see if I could find that, but it was just like ACH, Big Swole, Cedric Alexander, freaking uh, Shelton Benjamin, R Truth, Bobby Lashley, Ricochet. Um, and a couple others, uh, Brandy Rhodes. Uh, it's just that's right off the top of my head. <laughs> you got a whole list, it's just <laughs> but it's just crazy. But when you say you step away from wrestling, you know, just kind of get re center yourself, focus your mind and everything, and prepare for the next thing. What do you do in your spare time, dude? I mean, because you, you got a proponent of it now, but like, what, what is you watching? What is you watching on TV? Because I know I'm watching Wanda. <laughs> you watching any Marvel shit? <laughs> well, hey, well, I'm always training. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I'm always training. Training your, mind, uh, training your body. I'm just always going. <laughs> um, you know what I've been watching lately is the House, uh, the House of Paper. Uh, I think it's called Money Heist on uh, Netflix. Oh, okay. Yeah. I am so into it. I'm in the third season. Uh, the third part now, it's so good. I've also been getting into Black Mirror. I'm on the you catching up third on episode that, yeah, of that. I, I'm behind. Yeah, it's really trippy. I like the concepts. I can only handle a little at a time, <laughs> but um, but it's cool. Um, other than that, really, I don't watch a whole lot of TV uh, or anything like that. I listen to a lot of YouTube uh, videos and you know boring stuff. <laughs> so, so what what what's the rabbit hole then? I mean, what 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 trips are we taking down in YouTube? YouTube. Uh, well, you know, I, I listen to uh, Abraham Hicks a lot. She talks about the she's the law of attraction. Um, I listen to Jordan Peterson a lot. Um, anything really? I, I'm I'm kind of brainy. I like yeah, biography. life enriching. I hear you. Um, I like uh, documentaries a lot. But I'll I'll listen to them mostly because I like you know I'm I'm busy. I'm doing things, but I I'll listen. Joe Rogan. I listen to a lot. Um, yeah, a lot of MMA analyst type stuff. I listen to Shell Sonnen. A whole, I just became like a fan of him. I, I, I didn't even like him when he was fighting. And then I just watched a video or two and he's really charismatic. And I just find myself clicking on all his videos. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, speaking of Joe Rogan and you being a professional wrestler, what, what do you think about um, the interview with The Undertaker? Interview with The Undertaker. You know, I, uh, I listened to most of it so far. I have to finish a little part of it. Um, but it was great. I loved how long it was too and really uh detailed he got um it was a little uh strange because the whole my whole career i'm like okay if the undertaker can keep can keep it under under wraps then like like we have no excuse but then finally undertaker's like well i'm done and it's like you gotta respect the guy he's the undertaker yeah but it's like ah, i don't have him as a as an example anymore you know <laughs> yeah and 
that's kind of what I've been waiting for because as long as I've been a professional wrestling fan, he has been a part of that experience, you know? And I kind of felt like years ago, like way before his now retirement, you know, I kind of felt like that's what he would be doing more of, just like meet and greets and starting to come on shows more. That's truly a sign of, you know, this is the end and everything. But I got to tell you, man, over the last couple of years, I have... I have had a stain on my soul toward The Undertaker, man. He just pissed me off so goddamn much. <laughs> so fucking much. And I talked and I talked to this at length on um I have a wrestling podcast every now and then that we do. And I talked to that point at length. I didn't watch the Boneyard match. I didn't watch the Saudi shit. I didn't watch I haven't watched You didn't watch the Boneyard match though? Fuck no. I, I have, uh, why? I, Hold on, stop, stop. I'm with you. I'm listening to your points, but you gotta, you gotta make sure you just highlight why you specifically you, you were out, not interested on the bone yet. I have not watched an Undertaker match since he put his hat and gloves down in the ring against Roman Reigns. And that was in what year? What year was that? That that was in WrestleMania 19? in Orlando. I don't remember the year, but yeah. Okay. So I haven't watched the Undertaker match since then because motherfuckers shouldn't be having any matches. He should have been done in 27 when he had the end of an era match. Who are you to say he should be having any matches? I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know exactly what you're saying, but this is my caveat to every time that I say this. I'm going to say what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say this at the end so you understand Uh where I'm coming from. Uh Uh-huh. To me, he should have been done when he faced Triple H in that Hell in a Cell match at the WrestleMania, they was all arm in arm and they left. That sh- to me, that should have been the last match. But he continued on. Streak ended at 30. Should have been done right there. But he went on to fight Bray Wyatt at 31 the year next. Then he did the shit with Roman Reigns where he essentially retired on screen. Put his hat and shit in rings. I mean, even I know what that looks like, you know, in person. Mm-hmm. When you put your boots and your hat and your yep, gear. Yep, the whole deal. All over the internet. Thank you, Taker. Yeah, exactly. All that shit right there. All that pump and circumstance. Me, been with my wife 13 years. Never shed a tear at the birth of my child or, you know, just dire situations and all this other bullshit that we've been through in our marriage. And this dude put his shit down in the ring, put his gear in, threw his fist up and sunk down into the stage. I rolled the motherfucking tear in front of my wife. Because I thought it was done. I thought it was over. This dude that been with me through all my wrestling fandom in my childhood is hanging up. And it resonated with me because I just retired from the military for doing that shit for 16 years consecutively without a break. I got you. To leave it, I understood how that felt in that moment. To leave it all behind. So I was extra emotional. I was in the feelings. This is my feelings and I was in <laughs> So. Uh-huh. This motherfucker came back after that. What was his return match? Was it Saudi? Um, no, it was shit before Saudi. I forget. No. Are I you think- sure? I think his first match back was Saudi in Saudi with Kane. You, you're probably right, but I think there was something before that. I, I, think so? I'm, my mind is blocking all this shit out because I, I haven't been watching it, you know? So... After that point in time, I was like, fuck this dude. Fuck this dude for doing this to me. Fuck him for making me feel that way and do that shit that he did to me. Nah, I'm not standing for it. Then he had the shit with Goldberg to where, you know, his body was failing him. And Goldberg didn't help the situation either by running his goddamn head into the ring post. So that soured me on that. And then I didn't even watch that in whole because I because of the bullshit. It was just bullshit to me. Then... They had the other bullshit with the Saudi, the other Saudi show or whatever with the tag team match and the cane. And I didn't watch none of that shit. Then he kept hobbling out there and talking about this boneyard match and all this other bullshit. And I was like, nah, I'm not doing it. I ain't watching none of this shit. You, you're dead to me. Your dead man is dead. But I say all that to say this. I say that, you know, from an emotional standpoint, as a fan watching a product on TV. Now to Mark Calloway the man behind The Undertaker, I will never, 
ever, ever, ever fault a man for providing for himself and his family. But I don't have to fucking like it, <laughs> you know? And it, it, is, it is just an opinion because- You had a great point at the end. I was yeah. waiting for like, what's he gonna say? Cause I got some points to disagree with. And yeah. then you came at the end with it. Yeah. All right, you know, I respect that. You yeah, know, cause, well, cause, I, I gotta say this. Mm-hmm. That's professional wrestling done right. You said you shed a tear. Mm-hmm. They got you. That's exactly what they wanted to do. That was exactly how it was supposed to be. And it was left vague. He didn't say I'm retiring, right? Mm-hmm. He left it vague, boom. It's open for interpretation. It's leaving the yeah. door open. Because honestly, when, you, uh, when you're when you at that point of your career, you, you don't want to hang it up. You don't know if yeah. that's actually you don't know. Yet. So just in case, I'm going to give it my all. And yeah. then guess what? I reserve the right to change my mind because retirement yeah. is never... <laughs> you remember Ric Flair retiring? Exactly. That that's a, another beautiful <laughs> send off, man. And it was even stamped. This is the retirement. This is the end of Ric Flair's career in the right, ring, right? Whatever. I I can if you're gonna have the retirement fight, I can I can give a man this. I can give you the retirement fight, so you, that sets up the comeback fight. Okay, cool. You do the retirement fight. You let you do the comeback fight, and then you do the real retirement fight. That's that's as far as this should go. But it's getting to the point. People are retiring, unretiring, kind of retiring. But <laughs> I'm yeah. saying all this to say this. I love The Undertaker. And, and you know, that Saudi money is real, too. That, yeah, that, exactly. That Saudi I mean, Arabia that, money. That, it was huge. Mm-hmm. The money that they were throwing around. Shawn Michaels came back. <laughs> so, of course. I mean, you can't fault Shawn Michaels. You know, boom. So... Okay, maybe I would have done the same thing after yeah. I thought I was for sure retired and I still was, you know, maybe yeah. wanted to keep wrestling and this was a good opportunity. Hey, go get your money. Yeah, yeah. I, I will that. say that. Yeah. The Boneyard match. Now, remember, they were starting to hype the Boneyard match before the pandemic, right? I wasn't yeah. watching WWE, but before the pandemic, the Boneyard match was supposed to be a live, something different than mm-hmm. what we got. Mm-hmm. Then the pandemic started happening. Boom. Is WrestleMania still going on or was canceled? Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. No, we're still going on with the Boneyard match. I got to say, that was a masterpiece. I loved it. If you have not watched it, you need to go back and watch it. It was beautiful. And I was also salty sitting there watching this. You know why. Beyond wrestling, a little earlier in my career, maybe a couple years back, I was trying to come up with a cinematic match. You know, I had full blessings from the promoter, from Drew. I love Drew. He always let me... uh, do my creative things when I come at me, come at him with ideas. Beyond Wrestling's awesome. Drew Cordero, mm-hmm. you know, I broke my neck for that company and they canceled their next show and tried to raise money for my medical bills. So we're pretty, we're like blood, blood brothers, I guess. <laughs> I was planning this cinematic match in this uh, place that we were wrestling there at the time called Fet Music, the most, the coolest venue you've just ever been in. It looks like this medieval castle inside and it's just really dope. And for, you know, independent wrestling, not a lot of money, not a lot of resources. We just couldn't get it to happen. We needed stunt double. We just couldn't get it when we needed to get it. The time passed. I put it in my back pocket. A few years later, the final deletion comes out with Matt Hardy. And I'm like, whoa, this is kind of like my idea. And then, boom, um, uh, The Undertaker has that, you know, at WrestleMania. So it was really cool to see, even though I, I didn't get there first. You know, I feel like I was one of the innovators, but I just didn't get a chance to do it. Yeah. I felt it was so cool that it was a new way to tell a story in wrestling. It was just a new presentation. And I felt like that it has a place, especially with wrestling changing so much. I felt like they nailed it and it has a place. Well, you know what? The thing that scratched my itch in that vein was Lucha Underground. And oh, man. I yeah. love that shit because, I mean... It wasn't like, you know, a regular wrestling program to where I just drop in and be like, well, shit, I mean, what's going on? Who's the champ here or whatever? I mean, it was like a legit story to where you can watch it. It's timeless. Pretty yeah, much I love it. Is. It's, it's like it's a it's a TV show that just so happens to have professional wrestling. in it. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> it is a TV show, you know, like the matches are even like people in, die. in its own universe. <laughs> <laughs> and and you can kind of understand like okay it's lucha you know lucha there's not a whole lot of rules in lucha it's just like it's free fighting there is no rules it's just you go out there and fight you know so with that being you know the arena like you can accept you know uh what they're presenting you in the match some of the most cutting edge 
you know, cool things you don't normally see on a wrestling show with this cool narrative and this background and story. I loved Lucha Underground. I was trying to get into Lucha Underground for a little while there. Um, and when I actually kind of had the opportunity, I'm glad it didn't work out because uh, we all know what happened. happened people after, stuck yeah. in their contracts at the yeah. end. Um, but uh, digitally to remove a, a referee from a TNA match or something like that. <laughs> just you know, weird, weird, weird stuff. You know, but they had a short little run, and it was a great run. Yeah, shit. I got to speak to Brian Cage and uh, Marty Demoth. You know, while they was doing that stuff, man, and it was everybody that I got to talk to that dealt with that said it was a good time. Just like just the overall, you know, creation and the just the pro the, 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 ah, excuse me the process of the whole thing and whatnot i'm pretty sure they were kind of salty on some of the contract stuff but i mean as far as working and doing the product i heard nothing but good things <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah good experience good stories i is same <laughs> yeah uh, man but shit i i i can't i can't remember just sitting there waiting to see oh man what's the next episode gonna be like Goddamn, then they had the whole, you know, underlying story with the Pentagon and a freaking Vampiro. Mm-hmm. Just, Always uh, had a cliffhanger. Yeah. I liked it. I think that there's, a, there's a void now in the pro wrestling space for that, for whatever Lucha Underground started to introduce us to. Mm-hmm. There's a void now there. You know, the next company to kind of bring in that kind of presentation, I feel like is going to do very well. You know, and I'm I'm in the midst of creating my own thing. Um, you know, I have a company now called Luchaware. Luchaware. Luchaware.art. And um, you know, basically I take some of the best uh designers. Actually, all my designers are from different countries, <laughs> different continents, even, and we pair them up with some of the best wrestlers up and coming or you know, popular wrestlers that you know, and we make cool designs for them. And it's like a one-stop shop merch store, is you know, is our goal. And that's just one little aspect. That's Lucha wear. But what do you do with all the wrestlers? Okay, well, what do you call them? Well, we're the League of Luchadors. The LOL. The LOL for short. We're the League of Luchadors. I so that's like there. I'm building this uh, this foundation for a future wrestling company with all of the alliance uh, of these wrestlers here. And then you, you a gamer? You like Zelda? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know the Triforce. You know Lucha yeah. wear is one part of the Triforce. The League of Luchadors is another part of the Triforce. And then the last one is called We Can Lucha. And what does that mean? It means, you know, Lucha means fight. We can fight. Basically, it means we can fight too. And let me tell you a little story, Rob. Oh, shit, I'm ready. if 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 you live at somewhere like in the United States or Japan or Europe, there's a lot of wrestling around. If you're a wrestling fan, you could find a show. You might have to drive a little bit, you could find a show. If you want to train, you could probably find a good school. You know, opportunities everywhere. But if you live in a place like Timbuktu, like Zimbabwe, like Bolivia, and I'm not exaggerating. I know. Good luck <laughs> if you are a wrestling fan and you want to see live wrestling. You may never see a live wrestling show unless you leave your country. If you want to train, okay, you can go to the one guy with a wrestling ring that's really shitty in town that says he's a legend from back in the day that can't move anymore. Or you, can, or you have to travel across the world opportunity is not knocking at your door wwe doesn't even tour the last one the last uh, show they had they, they uh, scheduled in paraguay they had to cancel just because you know logistics so all those people finally were gonna see right no the point is the lucha economy i like to call it is not equal everywhere right lucha where we can lucha the league of luchadors we're trying to be that bridge that can better connect the lucha economy so what kind of things are you talking about, Zenshi? Well, I'm talking about taking some standout students. I already know Prince Diego comes to mind in Peru. Really, really good kid. Only been wrestling two years in a place like Peru, which is not a lot of uh, experience. But the way he's been studying, he is sharp. Bringing a guy like Prince Diego to America, bringing him to the WWE 4 school to get trained with the best, AR Fox, spending the whole week here training, having a live show on Thursday, going to some shows on the weekend, giving him that experience, bringing him back, and also bringing some American people to the, you know, let's do some networking here. You know, that's how we build each other up, you know? Yeah. And eventually, when Lucha Wear makes enough money, the Lucha, League of Luchadors can come down, and we can put on a big show with their local talent, bringing our talent, and boom, we break, raise everybody up. That's the vision. I'm trying to build something. 
Yeah, you trying to I'm plant starting seeds. with South America because I'm the South American, you know. <laughs> I said, you're trying to plant them seeds. I see you trying to grow a foundation. Of That's course. how you do it. Mm-hmm. Too many, too many wrestlers are just thinking I'm just going to be a wrestler and I have to sign that paper, that magical paper with the contract to make a living. And then, you know, for, a, for, for a long time, it's only been one game in town. You sell your soul and maybe it'll turn out, maybe they'll let you speak up or whatever, but you'll be set for life or be the starving artist and may never make it. You know what I mean? Now we got a little more options yeah, yeah. nowadays, and it's, it's a much healthier ecosystem overall. I'm not complaining. There's opportunity out there. But overall, you got you to gotta build something for yourself, young wrestlers. You know what I'm saying? You got to build something for yourself, and, and you got to give back. And that's what this machine is. So as a wrestler and as a fan of professional wrestling, um, with what it seems to be playing out on television with uh, AEW, AAA, and uh, New Japan and Impact. How does that make you feel as a fan and a professional wrestler? How it's playing out on TV is what you're saying. Yeah, just um, like I said, really. I don't really, I don't really watch a lot uh, of what's going on. I, I don't really have much of a po- especially with si- post pandemic. Hear the rumblings, homie. <laughs> I, what's that? I said you don't hear the rumblings, homie. I mean, uh, I know every now and then, home every now and then. Really, like, hey, honestly, it, to keep, I talked to one guy in AEW, a good friend of mine, uh, and we talked back and forth, private messenger, a lot about little, you know, little things. But really, that's about it. I don't really watch anything. I watch some AEW dark only, like mostly when my friends are on it. You know what I mean? When my friends are wrestling, or uh, you know, I don't. I've I've stopped watching WWE for a while. Yeah. I catch their pay per views for a while. I only watch the pay per views. Um, I I watched wrestle uh, what was the Royal Rumble most of it. Um, you know, uh, New Japan. I catch matches on YouTube randomly. And, you know, I'm busy. I'm doing other things. I'm building a business. Um, yeah. and my perspective is a little different as a wrestling fan after you know yeah. X amount of years. Um, I'm more in it as a creator. Um, uh, versus uh, a consumer. Mm. And it's just a different balance. Yeah. I know for me, speaking from the fan perspective or whatever, I mean, I think it's great that all these companies are working together or whatever. But I always, just in my mind, from a business standpoint or whatever, is like, how do you do this? You know, it's just like, all right, so you got, all right, matter of fact, uh, MLW just did it. They, they got dealing with a AAA, right? So, Leo Rush or Lionel Green, whatever the fuck he call himself now, he has your middleweight championship and he has the AAA cruiserweight. Oh, he won. Yeah, which you could have had, or which you could have. Wait, had. he won it. Yeah, Leo Rush won. Yeah, yeah. You really don't watch. <laughs> I didn't catch that episode yet. I'm not like a yeah. I, I know I'm on the episode, but I was at the arena. When you're when you're wrestling, you don't watch. Sometimes yeah. you, you cannot have time to watch the other matches. But yeah, I wrestled I Tank Man again in a rematch. Didn't quite go my way again. Um, but you know, I, I didn't I didn't catch the result. Wow, Leo Rush, uh triple A world cruiserweight champion and MLW middleweight champion. Man, that boy dripping in gold, ain't he? Yeah, he is. You know, you know it's funny, talking? I remember when Leo Rush was just a little kid, um, and you know, nervous before the match we were about to have, and I'm sitting here saying, Hey, relax. Listen to me out there. You got this kid, you know, and now look at him, you know, Hey, kudos to him, but I'm telling you, it's going to be short lived because uh, once I shake this losing streak off and I get back on my mojo and I find my Zen Leo rush, I'm coming for you. <laughs> see, see, that's what I'm talking about. Cause I mean, that was a championship that could have been potentially yours and you could have been the freaking triple A and middleweight champion. And uh, it's, Peruvian it's, international, and Peruvian, that and Peruvian. Triple, triple champ. Yeah, I mean, then you would be the drift and go. Which there's still time, there's still opportunity for this. So I mean, yeah, it's interesting. I'm looking for the opportunity. You know, it's about two years in it with MLW now, and I've been passed up on the Opera Cup twice now, both years. Um, and you know, they, they threw me a bone with this Triple A World Title. I really had to to fight for that too. There was a couple people in contention. I even had to, I, I even put up my Peruvian championship on the line, mm-hmm. um, you know, as a bargaining chip and flew down to Mexico to, you know, to, to, to make the deal. And it turned out 
we, you know, we, we were all for it, but it turned out with the red tape, they were like, all right, cruiserweight title match. And then I didn't do my job. I, I lost. I can't, I can't be mad. I got the opportunity, but outside of that, it's, you know, it's opportunity has been kind of slim at MLW uh, for Zenshi. I'll, I'll, I'll just say that. And um, it's about time something changes. Uh, it's about time something changes. Oh, okay. Well, I'm looking forward to the change, sir. You're gonna bring yeah. in the win to change. <laughs> Let's do it. It can start with a. It can start with a win. So I got to get back on it. Yeah. Um. I want to kind of backtrack before we put a pin in it or whatever, because one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is, yeah, I know you brought up Ray Mysterio, but is that the motivation for wearing the mask? He, that was the initial. Yeah, that was the initial thing. I'm I'm really big about like making things come full circle. Like, I don't know, like, I, I like, that's a theme in my life. So I was like, oh yeah. You know, at first when I started wrestling, honestly, I didn't wear a mask because I didn't want to be cliche in my mind. Oh, I, I don't want to be the black Ray Mysterio. Right. So I actually started with face paint. Cause I was like, I don't want to be like every other flippy black guy, but I don't want to be like, <laughs> yeah. the black that's why I do no flat liners. <laughs> but I'm going to do in between nobody else does face paint at the time. I love Sting. Sting was my first favorite wrestler back when I watched with my brother. And then Rey Mysterio became my all-time favorite. So I started with the face paint. But then after a while, you know, I had a, I don't know if you're aware, but I had a devastating injury that almost killed me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had an opportunity to return to wrestling with Chikara Pro Wrestling. But they said, uh, you got to be something else. You got to bring us something with a little more flavor for our audience. So uh, that's when I came up with uh, the next iteration of myself. There's a whole other story. I don't want to go off on another tangent. Yeah, that's like a Shinron, I believe, right? Shinron, you know, that's... Yeah. Screw it. Charade. Charade was my uh, was how I started as, you know, as wrestler as a wrestler. And I broke my neck two, two and a half years in doing a double moonsault. Opened up a little too early. Boom, it was on Tosh.0, World's Dumbest. It was on everywhere. Everybody saw the thing. There's comments on YouTube for days. A lot of people are saying he's actually really sick. He's actually really awesome. He just kind of messed up, which was the truth. And a lot of people are saying, look at this dumbass, right? He's the Phoenix though. I survived. I came back and I'm still wrestling. He's like the Phoenix that came back from the dead. Really? Charade's not dead. He's on YouTube because I comment on my Charade account, just ironically. <laughs> <laughs> so Charade lives on YouTube. Um, but uh, I needed something more. That gave birth to the, to the dragon, the all-powerful dragon. The, the, I wanted to show these guys what I could do, what I was really capable of. There's a lot of paths I could have taken. I could have quit wrestling. I could have come back, but be conservative. I could have come back, but like, there's so many things. But what I decided to do, I was going to show these guys I could be the best high flyer you've ever seen. That gave rise to Shinron, the dragon. And I really showed them over a period of years. I was in the conversation. I may, I wasn't known throughout the whole universe, but the people that knew me was like, this guy is legit, athletically, one of the best high flyers. But eventually, that wasn't enough. I was in the ring with the Young Bucks. I'd wrestled my hero, Matt Hardy. I'd, you know, I was a little unfulfilled at that point. I was like, well, what do I do now? So that's when I had to kind of bring it full circle. As Shinran, I was hiding from my past. I was hiding from charade. I was, I'm a different, boom, boom. I had to embrace what, what made me who I was. I had to find my Zen, so to speak. Zen Shi means complete history. So now embracing my past, you got the Phoenix on one side, you got the dragon on the other. We are now complete. I'm more of a complete artist. I'm not just a high flyer. I'm the aerial artist. Mm -hmm. So going back to everybody does a flat line, everybody does a cutter. Every high flyer does a moon. So, you know, I try to really change the game. I don't do four fifties off the top rope. I do it off the bottom rope. Mm -hmm, I, I, don't do six, I do a six thirty off the second rope. I'm the only one on the planet that does that. My arsenal is primarily of moves I created. I'm the aerial artist. I'm a step above these guys. Like Khabib Nurmagomedov says, these guys can't hang with me. I'm a step above. <laughs> <laughs> I just might have to retire, Rob. <laughs> these guys can't hang. <laughs> And then Court Bauer is going to have to have meetings with me trying to get me back to the table. Maybe we got to switch it up. <laughs> As a, hey, well, whenever you do retire, make sure you stay retired. God damn it. Don't make me cry. <laughs> make sure I stay retired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to.
remember every time I want to come back to the comeback fight, I'm gonna have you in my head. Oh, wait a minute, Rob's gonna be disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> you sit there nodding in disapproval. <laughs> <laughs> but but I wouldn't fault you though, because I understand what you're doing. I mean, you're a man and you dag on if you ain't fulfilled, you gotta get something done, you gotta get it off your chest, you gotta dag on do it, you gotta do it. And I gotta respect you for that. But don't think I have to like it though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're, we're, we got a long way before I'm thinking about having the retirement, leaving the gloves in the ring talk. So, uh, you know, let's let's keep it pushing. We got things to we got things to do. Very well. Well, speaking of things we got to do, because I got to wrap up some stuff around here. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. And it's been a pleasure to have you. I wish you all the success in everything that you do um, before you go. Let everybody know where they can find you on social media and what you got going on, man. Well, first of all, I really appreciate it. You know, this is a, it's been a cool natural flow too. You know, some other shows it's like, okay, five, four countdown, make sure you, blah, blah, blah. you know, you're just right into it. I love the, I love the energy, bro. Uh, so keep it up. Um, you can find me primarily at Instagram at the aerial artist. Um, Twitter suspended me for no reason. Um, a couple of months ago, it's kind of, kind of crazy. I, I log in, I barely post on Twitter. I just, it's not my thing, but I finally, I was in a tweeting mood. I'm like, I'm going to tweet today. I log into my Twitter. I make my tweet, my one tweet of the month. And I go to press it and it says, you can't do that. And I'm like, why? And it says, there's no reason. You're just suspended. And I'm like, why? And I write to support and I get no answer. And I'm like, why? So I'm, me and Twitter aren't happy right now. So it's Instagram. It's facebook.com slash the aerial artist. You can go to luchaware.art. Buy some sick gear. You can find uh, Zeta Zhang gear. You can find some Calvin Tankman gear. Laredo Kid is coming down the pipeline. Myron Reed. You got uh, Brian Pillman Jr. is coming. You got Hammerstone. You got Zinchi oh, merch. The Wode. Damian Tangra. I'm doing all the shout outs right now. You got Ryo. Who else I got? You can get you a, a, a Vanity Wrestle Bay face mask. You can get you a Larry Legend smiles are contagious face masks you can get you how about facade how about facade? everybody loves the neon ninja you can go with what about bolivian legend viva mortis really cool stuff at lucha wear come check us out come support us and uh yeah that's it the aerial artist the south american zenshi signing off <laughs> so as it is for every guest of the random realms with rob you've been a guest and the door is always open for you to come back to promote your next big thing or just to come shoot the shit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to be sending you more of my luchadors from uh, the league of luchadors. So uh, you're going to have a steady stream of content if you so want it. Hey, I, I so much appreciate it. <laughs> there we go. Peace. Hello. Hey, this is Hoppy. What's up, everybody? I'm over here cooking dinner with hooks, rubs, and spices. Uh, B Rob turned me on to this stuff, and I tell you what, it's great. It's a homemade blend of the finest ingredients sourced from Texas gardens, farmers, and markets. And it's some good shit. I tell you what, try the smoke and sweetness, or you can try Hoppy's favorite, the mad cow, which is a nice peppery slap in the face. One taste, and you'll be hooked. Hooks, rubs, and spices.